Hey, let's do it for the content. Mega Ray. Let's go. Let's get it. Dick Kick City. It gets gritty when Mega Ray come through. The kid gets busy. Work yourself into a shoot, but you know it's legit. Like what you like, just don't be a dick. Hey, that's no wet regret. Let's get it. What's that set? Maybe you should bottle it. Drink it and spray it on. Get called to model it. Eight years in, can't look back. Who else can make the lost sweatsuits look whack? Wrestling with regret. Let's get it. Yeah. It was 17 years ago this week that one of the greatest wrestling shows of that year was held, ECW One Night Stand. June 12, 2005, the Hammerstein Ballroom in New York City. Beginning as a suggestion by Rob Van Dam, WWE cashed in on the massive success of their Rise and Fall of ECW DVD by putting on what was, at the time, a one-off nostalgia special. Combining their contracted talent who had ECW ties, a few hand-picked outsiders, and even a brand invasion storyline, the show was a critical and financial success in its own right. One Night Stand earned 340,000 pay-per-view buys, one of the biggest numbers for a non-Big Four pay-per-view that year. And of course, it set in motion the return of ECW as a third brand, though the less said about that, the better. One Night Stand accomplished a lot of things way back in 2005, but one thing it also did that doesn't get talked about nearly as much these days is that it made Shane Douglas very upset. After WWE announced they were putting on their tribute show, the franchise was concerned that the company he hates the most would bastardize the one thing he could hang his legacy on. Thus, he decided to put on what he felt would be a true ECW reunion, and that's how we got Hardcore Homecoming. Produced by Douglas, Jeremy Borash, and original ECW owner Todd Gordon, the show took place at that famous arena on the corner of Swanson and Rittner on June 10th, two days before One Night Stand. Grabbing all the unsigned former ECW talent that WWE didn't take the option on, Hardcore Homecoming was presented as the organic, non-corporate alternative for the weekend. And though there was some overlap in talent between the two shows, they were presented in very different ways. But instead of looking at it as a one or the other kind of thing, I would say these two shows actually complement each other. I'll go on, but for now, let's dive right into this trademark free homage to ECW, Hardcore Homecoming. First things first, this show was not sold as a pay-per-view. It was a show that was filmed, then made available later on DVD. I can only imagine how awesome it would have been to be there live in the sweltering heat of that building. 1,200 strong, the sights and the sounds pulsating around me in real time. That would have been great, but that was not the experience DVD viewers got. After an opening hype package showing the fans lined up outside the arena, we hear an emotional word from Terry Funk. The hardcore legend famously chose Homecoming, and therefore a smaller paycheck, over One Night Stand, because he only had the ability to wrestle one match that weekend, and went with Shane's operation because he felt his was being done for the right reasons. Honestly, it was a really cool and noble move by the Funker. And that's why I'm not a millionaire. Todd Gordon opens the proceedings. He says something on the mic, but you can barely make it out because between the acoustics, the sound mixing, and all the covering up of licensed themes all show long, this DVD is the equivalent of filling your ears up with warm pudding. Joey Styles delivers his classic line, then here comes Joel Gertner to one of the biggest ovations of the night. Gertner goes all out for his trademark rhymes. At one point, he busts out a 12 Days of Christmas reference in June, which had me legitimately worried he was just going to go through the whole song right then and there. And thank God he didn't, because the fans would have been blown up before the opening bell. The man who bangs on the Tiffany, like two, ten, drummer drumming. But here comes Cyrus, sporting a haircut that makes him look like Senator Butthead. Look, Don, you either go with the long hair or the short look you have now, no in between. Cyrus heals it up on the stud muffin, and the two recreate their classic beef. No, sir, I have no idea why Vince didn't want to have this kind of magic on his version of the show. I will say, it certainly looked more like an ECW production than One Night Stand did. Not exactly a compliment in 2005, but there you go. Styles calls the action in post-production from what sounds like a heavily padded broom closet, but he has enough energy that for the most part, it feels like he's right there in the thick of it. And I'll give the showrunners credit for the way they danced around the fact they did not have the rights to anything ECW. Unlike, for example, Hardcore Justice 2010, you didn't hear him say things like, that Philadelphia-based company, or that hardcore company. But remember what I said about how they try to cover up the licensed music in post? Yeah, it's not great. Over three was made. And here comes Tracy. Two cold Scorpio. 
whistling? You did a crowd noise loop with whistling? And you play that over and over again in every entrance, in every match? Why? No! No! Why? Why? No! 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 Why? Our opening contest sees Simon Diamond and C.W. Anderson, the extreme horseman, taking on Mikey Whipwreck and Chris Chetty. It was a serviceable opener that saw the good guys get the win. The next match saw the Blue Meanie take on Tracy Smothers in a return to one of the all-time comedic rivalries in ECW. It had all the familiar hits, Smothers getting tons of heat, the referee getting some spots in, the dance-off, all leading up to a dirty Smothers victory. It's great fun. But did Joey Styles really think he was going to get away with doing the same FBI joke two shows in a row? Like earlier today, he asked me if the, the innuendo was an Italian suppository. Earlier today, J.T. Smith came up to me and asked me if an innuendo was an Italian suppository. Then it's time for a memorial segment, a heart-wrenching look back at the ECW alum who'd passed away up until then, a grim reminder of the mental and physical toll wrestling can take on a human being. Surely you can trust the showrunners and the fans to handle this subject in a tasteful, respectful manner. Well, that's classy. There it is. So this part's bizarre to say the least. Pitbull, Gary Wolf, and Johnny Grunge of Public Enemy come out to eulogize their respective tag partners. Tammy Sitch shows up to pay tribute to her partner, Chris Candido, who'd passed away only a month and a half before the event. The juxtaposition of a cheery Sonny hopping around the ring while Joey Styles somberly tells the story of Candido's untimely death is, well, it's something. He broke his ankle on a, on a live pay-per-view and then due to a blood clot, he passed away. 34 years old. Because someone had to get heat in the memorial segment, I guess. Out come Danny Dorian Roadkill. Dorian looked to be in great shape here, by the way. It looks like somebody was trying to get signed. The heels beat down Grunge and Wolf until Sonny emerges with 911. The big man chokeslammed the baddies. Grunge fell off the top rope and threw a table. 911 tried and failed to get Sonny on his shoulders. And then finally, Sonny got up and led everyone in a prayer circle to close things out. It was the most insane 30 seconds of the entire show. Now, I hate following something distasteful up with something sobering, but it's worth pointing out, Johnny Grunge would sadly pass away less than a year after the show due to problems with sleep apnea, while Sonny would go on to stay Sonny. On we go to our next matchup as Kit Cash takes on Two Cold Scorpio, who looks the same now as he did 17 years ago. At this time, Scorpio was one half of the GHC tag champs in Pro Wrestling Noah, but you wouldn't be able to tell with the seemingly deliberate way he is avoiding showing the belt off. You never get a good look at it, which is a shame. But sure, let everyone at Casino Magic know you're the replica WCW champion. No problem. More than any high spot in this match, to me the biggest highlight here is just how mad Hat Guy is at Cash. <laughs> This match was the best of the night up to that point. There was high flying, there was crowd brawling, Scorpio no selling his own belt, and in the end, Scorpio hit the 450 to win. Up next, John Cronus came out of retirement to partner with his old teammate Perry Saturn, who had to back out due to injury. Is it the one where he got shot in the neck and the shoulder while saving a woman from being raped? Because if so, yeah, man, good on you. That's a really good reason not to make a booking. Respect. So Cronus was set to face Axel and Ian Rotten in a handicap match instead. Even though Bad Breed were banned from ever teaming up again since 1994, they said this didn't count because this was not a tag team match. This is them, quote, beating up some motherfucker. <laughs> Whatever you say, man. But out comes New Jack and the Gangstonators reunite. It's a good old-fashioned punchy-punchy, stabby-stabby. Despite the editing team's best efforts, you can still clearly hear Ice Cube under the dubbed theme. Then... Axel and Ian Rotten! Halfway through the brawl, Joey Styles' commentary just cuts out for a good length of time, and all you can hear is the muffled, echoey loop of the crowd. I feel like I was hit in the back of the head, and I'm just regaining my wits now. This is hell. We are in hell. Then a scaffold is just wheeled in for New Jack to jump off of, which he does. He splats Ian Rotten, and I guess things are over now. New Jack takes the mic afterward, and well, let's just say it was probably more than his legal problems in New York that kept him from working the Hammerstein that Sunday. I am the original in this goddamn business. It's almost like having sex with a fine-ass bitch. 
And then to wrap that all up, we get one of the worst best transitions I've ever seen on a commercially produced wrestling DVD. As soon as I found out that this show was going to happen. Oh yeah, if I'm Jerry Lynn, that's a sound by I want fans to hear last before I dissolve into frame. After a promo that really drives home why he's remembered as a great wrestler, Mr. JL takes on his old rival in Just Incredible, accompanied once again by Jason, a man whose entire existence I've yet to figure out all this time. It's Lynn's first match in almost a year since his shoulder surgery, but you could hardly tell based on how these guys worked. From a technical standpoint, it was by far the best match in the card, but with the new effing show involved, was there ever any doubt? The finish saw Jazz show up to take out Jason, which having just watched Heatwave 99 last week is a callback I appreciated tremendously. Jerry Lynn wins with the Cradle Pile Driver, I'm driven closer to madness with this terrible crowd noise, and Joey Styles shills hard for the money. One of the most historic events I have ever had the pleasure of being involved in. Some of the greatest t-shirts I have ever seen. On we go to a bout between Raven and the Sandman. Raven's accompanied by the Blue Meanie, who was babyface like an hour ago, and the Musketeer, who, much to my surprise, was actually a real character in the old ECW. I'm always thrown for a loop when I watch an old ECW show and just see some random ass ringside gimmick like a musketeer or somebody's butler or a Paul Heyman clone. Like these were actual things then. And then we all get mad during the reboot when zombies and vampires are showing up. I'm sorry, what legacy were we defending there exactly? Naturally, there's no way the franchise got the rights to enter Sandman, so in lieu of any music, the DVD crowd gets an extended split screen where we can only see the entrance on one side and hear the Sandman on the other talking about how cool his entrance is. Like, yeah man, we know. We wish we could experience it right now. Raven gets the crowd riled up with his pre-match promo, and then the bloody affair begins. Sandman goes on a big comeback near the end, fending off the musketeer and the meanie. The latter of the two getting 14 staples in his head thanks to a chair. If only that were the worst part of his weekend. Then there's a run-in from longtime ECW jobber Don E. Allen, because at this point, why not? Then Mikey Whipwreck shows up. But instead of saving his savior, he betrays Sandy with the whippersnapper, and no, we never find out why. Raven wins the day. And is that really a shock? At this point, he is like the most active and visible wrestler we're going to see all night. Before we go to the main event, Terry Funk makes his way to the ring and announces he wants barbed wire tonight. Then with the power of editing, the whole rope replacement process is covered up with a lovely video package where they talk about the night the line was crossed and Born to be Wired, the show where Sabu infamously cut his bicep open with barbed wire, then taped it back shut mid-match. Ooh, that creeps me out so much, my bones want to leave my body. But I don't understand, isn't Pennsylvania's Athletic Commission very much against barbed wire? According to this article I found online when doing research, when the ring crew came out to replace the ropes, they were immediately sent to the back, and a whole lot of nothing took place before the show was finally given the go-ahead. So how did Shane convince the commission to let the slide. Did he show them the size of the gate? Offer them a bribe, perhaps? Or maybe they just didn't want to upset sweet 60-year-old Terry Funk, who all he wanted was some darn barbed wire. God damn you, Douglas! He's a shit! See? He loves it! Once the barbed wire brouhaha was finally resolved, out came the man behind all this, Shane Douglas himself. Coming to the ring with Francine for the first time since 1999, he got a nice response from the crowd, then got really intense on the microphone, and the fans didn't know how to react. I told that piece of shit, if I ever saw him again, I would send him back to Amarillo, Texas, in a goddamn wheelchair. The DVD release only gives us music and commentary, no crowd audio at all for Sabu. But for once, the folks behind this show do the right thing and have the Funker come out to no music, so you can hear the genuine reaction from the crowd. A very nice touch. The match begins, and first of all, Shane looks way out of his depth here. Barbed wire was never his thing, and this match shows. But don't worry, Funk and Sabu do enough of their own hideous barbed wire spots to make up for it. Now, I'll never understand this. Throughout the match, you keep going back to this really bad-looking split screen that includes some fan cam angles, but the layout is such you can hardly see either shot. Sometimes they're only up for a second or two. It's absolutely jarring and unnecessary, especially because of the wild difference in frame rate. You're telling me Jeremy Borash produced this? I'd rather put my name on World Wrestling All-Stars before this DVD. The Funker gets caught in the wire so badly they have to cut him out. Meanwhile, Francine and Bill Alfonso brawl and take a bad looking tumble on the ramp. But hey, Francine's ass. Two thirds into the match and these fans are done. I don't know how much of it is the heat in the building, show fatigue, fatigue or the sudden realization that one of their heroes could bleed out in front of their very eyes, but this crowd is dead quiet here, and I don't mean that in that respectful Japanese style either. Ah! Ah! 
fuck? Douglas lays out multiple refs, then grabs a ladder. Before you could ask who the hell does he plan on hitting from there, or why is Terry humping a chair with his face, the lights cut out and Mick frickin' Foley teleports into the ring, referee shirt and all. He busts out Mr. Sacco, which understandably gets booed by the ECW faithful. I'm just saying, if the New York fans are gonna boo the 619 in two nights for it being too WWE, then you know that sock's getting the business. But Foley wins the crowd back by wrapping barbed wire around the sock and doing another mandible claw, a spot that only looked a little bit better when he did it again to Edge at the following WrestleMania. The franchise is eliminated and we're down to Funk and Boo. Terry climbs the ladder, but then it collapses. It fucking collapses. I have never seen that before and that was fucking amazing. I had to stop watching for about 10 minutes the first time I saw that, so I could catch my breath. Can you imagine if that happened during the blackout, for example? Imagine this. The lights come back up, Mick Foley's there doing the bang bang, and off on the side, laying in a crumpled heap, is Shane Douglas with a broken ladder and no one could see how it happened. That would have been incredible. Side note, the second disc of this set includes lots of bonus material, including some more of that fan cam footage. Despite having a place on the menu, the alternate angle of the ladder breaking is not on the disc. Damn it, why do they mock me so? Sabu hits the Arabian face buster on Funk after that madness, and he wins mercifully. The locker room empties out and shows everyone some love, and I gotta say, that closing shot of the Funker basking in the adulation made me feel more emotions than the tribute segment earlier, or One Night Stand for that matter. And in the end, despite its massive faults in post-production, that's what Hardcore Homecoming had that One Night Stand didn't have, what Douglas had talked about from day one, the emotional connection. One Night Stand was an amazing show, but the heart, the soul of ECW, was far more prevalent in the new Alhambra Arena on Friday than it was in the Hammerstein Ballroom on Sunday. And on that level, I can at least appreciate that. I think Shane Douglas did the best with what he was allowed to work with here. No match was awful, Lynn Credible and the main event were my two faves when it came to action and story, but WWE did win the weekend in terms of overall match quality. One Night Stand 05 is a seminal pay-per-view on its own, simply because, holy shit, can you believe they got that guy and that guy? Even so, Homecoming checked all the boxes of what made an ECW show an ECW show, both the good and the bad. I think it's fair to say this show might never have happened if WWE hadn't decided to put their tribute show on first, but Douglas certainly lived up to what he wanted and what he promised the public. And in doing so, the weekend of June 10, 2005 gave fans a richer and slightly more comprehensive ECW experience. Much like how WWE kept going with the ECW revival, Douglas saw how successful his show was and took Hardcore Homecoming on the road for the rest of the year. They put on three more shows before ultimately stopping, and though ECW revivals would continue in different names for several more years, that was the end of Hardcore Homecoming itself. True to what the franchise wanted all along, it was a show that ECW purists could be proud to watch and support, but more so if you were there live. So what were your thoughts on Hardcore Homecoming? Were you there to see it live and in person, or did you watch it on DVD like I did? Let me know in the comment section below. Stay tuned for next week when I review a classic ECW pay-per-view from the actual classic ECW. But until then, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.